Okay, welcome everybody to Teens and Technology, What to Do When Devices Rule. This is Joshua Wayne in the Your Successful Teen Program. Tonight, we are going to talk about teens and tech and what to do about that cell phone that seems glued to their hands at all hours of the day. Let's take a quick look at the agenda and then jump right into it, shall we? Let's first talk, we're first gonna talk about teen and technology use today. We're gonna to look at some of the recommended amounts. So the first one, we'll talk about some of the actual statistics that are coming out about how much technology teens are actually engaging in. We'll talk about some recommended amounts and we will talk about key considerations for parents today in addressing that with their teens and then also how do you address challenging situations. Um, we're actually not doing Q&A, that's sort of a leftover on the slide I just realized from uh, a live presentation. So uh, this is just going to be a recording for you, but um, in that I have presented on this many a time and know a lot of the questions parents tend to ask. Um, you'll be getting a lot of that just in the course of the, of the actual presentation. Okay, well a quick look back. Any of this look familiar? Atari, Pong, Pac-Man. I remember, I remember playing Pong in Steve Jarmel's basement when I was like in third grade and his mom just had to just tear us, tear us away from it. Couldn't get enough Pong. And then there was like the double Pong and I think there was two balls going on at one time. Pong, I don't know. Had Atari, I remember that. I remember Pac-Man, when Pac-Man came out, it was the coolest thing ever, Ms. Pac-Man. Anybody ringing a bell for anybody? So <clears throat> that's some of the stuff that we uh, may have grown up with, if you're, if you're watching this, if you're a parent uh, in, today's, in today's day and age. Some of this may sound familiar. Here's an interesting modern comparison, though, that will make you think. If you have an iPhone, or an Android phone for that matter, there is more computing power in that iPhone, more complexity by, I don't even know what factor, but by many, 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 many times as much computing power in your iPhone than there was in the Apollo mission, Apollo 11 mission that put Neil Armstrong on the moon, okay? Pretty incredible if you think about it, um, how much it has evolved in the last, I mean, 30 to 40 years, but literally in the last five to 10 years, you know, truly, if you think about it. Really remarkable. Um, the arc of, of technology acceleration that we're in at the moment. And if you think about it, <clears throat> some of the things we grew up with and some of the things we may be accustomed to will kind of make us look like this to them, meaning your kids, our kids today, right? Kind of look like Little House on the Prairie. Um, you know, chopping wood, carrying water out, you know, mama churning the butter out back. Um, just kind of almost makes it seem that, that outdated. Um, so we're going to talk primarily about screen time, okay? And we're, so when I define screen time, that's TV in all its many forms. So a lot of TV now is Netflix on a cell phone or an iPad or a laptop. Um, it's video games, which again could be happening in any of the venues I just mentioned. It's internet. Um, you know, increasingly for kids, so much of their life is happening on their cell phone, right? I mean, you know, I'm still more oriented towards a computer um, and an iPad than I am towards an actual phone, but nevertheless, like that is where so much of the activity is going on. And then texting, IMing, Skyping, social media, Instagram, Snapchat, you know, whatever, whatever the flavor of the day is. And I don't mean to speak negatively about any of it, but you know, it's constantly evolving and there's sort of always a new flavor of ice cream that everybody's interested in. Um, so that's really what we talk about when we're talking about screen time. So how much screen time are kids today consuming? So the data that's coming out suggests that kids and teens, eight to 18, are spending nearly four hours a day in front of a TV screen, um, plus an additional two hours of computer, not including schoolwork, playing video games and surfing the internet. And a lot of estimates are showing that as much as seven and a half hours a day is the amount of screen time that teens are engaged in today, seven and a half hours. Okay, and I've had a lot of parents say that seven and a half hours would be an absolute joy because it's 10, 11, 12 hours or up until the middle of the night, I can't get them to turn it off or go to sleep. If you do the math on that, that adds up to 42 hours per week of screen time, almost two full days. Over the course of a year, that is three full months spent in front of a screen. Think about that. Almost three months, almost 25% of our, of our waking time 
of our total time spent in front of a screen. How about that? By contrast, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that children older than two watch no more than two hours of quality screen time per day. I guess quality is pretty subjective, which includes television, non-related computer time, video games. No more than two hours. They also recommend the kids under two not watch any television. Okay, that's what the American Pediatrics Association or Academy of Pediatrics, rather, is saying. Um, it's what they believe, what they believe things should be. What are the potential costs of this excessive screen time? You know, I'm not going to sit here and, and spout out a bunch of research at you. Um, you can do all the you know research you want on this, but I will just kind of give a few high level points that seem to be indicative of more and more where where this is going and what some of the concerns are that are being expressed about this. Reduce creativity due, due to limited sensory input, right? If kids are just taking in information visually and they're not out there being more physical and tactile and working with their hands and their, and their senses and using sort of the, all of their senses, um, there's suggestions that this is le leading to reduced creativity. If it's just, you know, that just lots of physical, I'm sorry, just visual, and I guess to some extent auditory input coming in, um, that it's, it's reducing creativity. Impaired academic performance. Youth with TVs in their bedrooms to do, to tend to do worse on tests than those without, okay? Weight issues. For each hour of TV watched, and I suppose you could add that, you know, Netflix, video games, et cetera, screen time, a child will consume an additional 167 calories, according to the archives of pediatric and adolescent medicine. Interrupted sleep patterns. The more TV children watch, the more likely they are to have trouble falling asleep or to have an irregular sleep schedule. And I've heard that's because of just all the intense electrical stimulation that goes on in their brain, um, that it just sort of can actually interrupt uh, our, our sleep cycles, uh, circadian rhythm, that uh, has us sort of normally cycling through, through you know, sleep. Behavior problems. Youth with excessive use are more likely to have social, emotional, and attention problems, according to the Mayo Clinic. Watching excessive amounts of TV at age four is linked with bullying at ages six through 11. And it can also lead to social isolation, excuse me, and reclusive habits. So again, there's plenty of information out there about this. My point is not to, to try to you know, compile a bunch of academic data here, but it's just to highlight some of the, the potential costs to this problem, okay? So as much of a challenge as that is, we also realize we can't turn the clock back, right? Like we are on this arc of a increasing technology and for at least most of us and the way we live our lives today, it would be very difficult to turn the clock back. We're probably not gonna go back to Little House on the Prairie anytime soon, right? And we wouldn't necessarily want to, right? I think we all appreciate some of the conveniences of modern life and we don't necessarily want to go back to a, a horse and buggy culture and, and try to turn back time that much. Um, but that all said, probably most of us at the same time would like to find the right balance, right? And for our kids, for our teenagers, what is the right balance? I think we'd like to, I think most parents are, are grappling with this question. Now, I think that the most important question to ask yourself in this conversation is this. Who is currently in charge of how technology is used in your home? Who's in charge? Really think about that for a second. Who calls the shots about how it gets used on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it you or is it your kids? Who's really determining how it gets used? Who's got the reins is another way of saying that, right? Like who really has the reins of this issue in your home? Now, ultimately, what I'm gonna to suggest to you is that you have to decide what works for you in the home as the parent. You know, if you're, if you're challenged by this and you're troubled by this and your kids' use of technology and the ways they use it and the extent to which they use it is frustrating to you, then you've got some work you got to do and you've got some questions you really have to ask yourself. You know, this question about who's in control of it is, a, is an important question and you really have to think it through. And some of the, the, the sub-questions may be, what are your rules? Right, like what? What are your rules? What do you? How do you want technology to be used in your home? What is? What feels right to you? 
what does your gut say is the right amount? Is it two hours a day of non-school work screen time? Is it the wild, wild west and just as much as they want to use? And even if that means they're up till 2 o'clock in the morning, which a lot of kids are these days, what do you want it to be, right? That really in some ways is, is the ultimate question is how do you want it to be? And we're going to talk about some of the ways to bring that to bear um, and some of the tools you're going to need in order to, to maybe bring it to right size, if you will, the way in which and the degree to which technology is used in your home. Now, as we talk about this, I'm going to give you four critical caveats that I think are important for you to think about. Okay, Number one is you need to walk your talk. We'll talk more about all these in a moment. Number one is you need to walk your talk. Number four is be calm, clear, consistent, and confident with your rules, what I'm calling the four C's here. Number three, you and your spouse need to be on the same page. And a lot of these will sound familiar to other themes you've heard, you're hearing throughout the Your Successful Team program. And number four is help them self-regulate. Let's jump into it, shall we? You have to make sure you walk your talk or they will notice, right? What am I saying here? What I'm saying is that if you're telling them that they need to be to curtail their technology use, then mom and dad, you also have to do the same at some level, right? You can't, you can't, it's hard to parent from behind an iPad. And you also can't be, you know, using your technology sort of as much as you want and whenever you want and however you want, and at the same time limiting, trying to limit your kids' use of technology. They're gonna they're gonna call you a hypocrite, and it's gonna be very difficult for you to make the sound argument um, that you can do it the way you want to do it, but that they need to to scale back their activities. Now, granted, you know, a lot of what you the way you may be using technology is for work, and I understand that you're the breadwinner. Um, and you have, you know, you may have to do that as a part of, you know, supporting your family. And I get that. Um, and I, and probably even to an extent, your kids can get that. Nevertheless, I do think this is an important theme that you need to think about, about how you walk your talk around this issue, right? If it's, if it's do as I say, and not as I do, at some point that argument's going to give. It's not going to hold water, and your kids are going to see it, and they're going to push back on you, and they're going to be rebellious, and you aren't, frankly, going to be able to make a very sound argument about why they need to scale down from seven hours a day to two hours a day, or whatever you decide. Again, I'm suggesting to you, you need to decide what's right for your home, okay? Ultimately, that's a parent, parental decision. But if you decide that it's, you know, you want to scale them back from seven hours to two hours or what have you, four hours, cut it in half, or something like that, you need to you need to really be able to walk your talk around it. Okay, enough said on that. Use the four C's: clear, calm, co consistent, and confident. You've heard me talk about most of these in one way or another throughout the program, but let's let's apply them here to the use of technology. Number one, the first C: be clear, be clear and coherent about the, what the rules are. Communicate them in advance. It's always going to work better for you if you establish in advance, hey, technology goes off at 9 o'clock in our home. Like This is the rule how it's going to be, and we're all going to put our devices away at 9 o'clock um, or at 10 o'clock or whatever the rules are. Or you know, on weekends, you get you know, one hour, you know, two hours during the day um, to use it, and then one hour at night or something like that. Whatever you land on, to be very upfront, to be unambiguous, Right, this is almost kind of black and white, like this picture. It should be black and white. Here's what the rules are. Now you can always be flexible and give us a little extra time, but you want the more you're clear up front around expectations and rules, the more you're going. To, it's going to work in your favor. So you want to communicate them in advance, right? We're going on vacation, and here's how technology is going to work on vacation, or here's how it's going to work on the weekends, or here's how it's going to work on school days, right? And there's lots of different options about how you approach it. And what your rules are, but the key thing is to be clear and upfront about it. Communicate them in advance. Be calm. You've heard me say this a million times in the program. It's as true here as it is with anything else. Calmly and confidently explain what you plan to do in advance if possible. Keep your cool even when you have disagreements. Be, be willing to walk away or take a break if you need to. You got to find your calm place in this conversation, especially if you were in a situation where your kid's use of technology, where they had the reins of it. And they were the ones who were really determining how technology was used in your home. And you decide as part of this process that you're going to take the reins back on that. 
you should expect some pushback. They're not going to like it. You may be in for a bit of a fight. You may have a bit of an uphill climb you have to do around that. You're going to need to use those tools that we talked about throughout the program about finding your center, about being calm, about being that, finding that calm place. And even if you have to walk away for periods of time to make sure that you're holding that and maintaining that, you've got to be the rock that's holding it all together and being really calm, cool, calm, and collected. Be consistent. Be consistent with your rules. Whatever you permit, you promote. That really applies here, right? If you stretch the, they will stretch the rules if you let them, right? If it's, well, technology goes off at, at 9 o'clock and then it's 9.30 and they're saying, well, just five more minutes, just five more minutes, just five more minutes, very quickly your, your rules can go out the window, right? So if you establish rules, you know, first and foremost, you have to really be confident in them, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, you know, you have to feel like this is, this is it. You and your spouse need to be on the same page. This is what we're doing. This is how it's going to be and feel really sure about it. You can always reevaluate it. You can always change it if it doesn't work out. You can always say, hey, listen, we were wrong about this. We're turning, you know, we, we, we said it was going to be off at 8 o'clock, but we realized that 9 o'clock is the right time. And, you, know, you can always eat some humble pie, and that's actually a good thing to model for your kids. If you say, hey, listen, we were trying this, and it didn't quite work out the way we thought. We're reevaluating it. But once you establish that new rule, if you change the way things are being handled and what the rules and expectations are, be consistent. Okay, very important because they if you if you let them if you let them stretch the rules you should expect that they're going to whatever you permit you promote and be confident right not like Scooby Doo and Shaggy be confident in your decision you don't have to justify your rules okay ultimately now you you can and it's nice to be able to be you know logical but you don't have to get into endless well why. Why? Well, why do we have to turn off the devices at 9 o'clock? Why can't I be on my computer as late as I want to be? Why can't I? You know, you can have justifications, and I, and I think it's uh, fair to give them a reasoning. But you also kind of need to be confident enough to state your rules and then be done with it, right? Because it doesn't lead to good sleep habits when you're up till 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you know, pinging your friends on, on Instagram or playing video games to one o'clock in the morning. You know, maybe you give them sort of one night a week, like on a weekend with their friends, you know, to go crazy. But then, you know, during the week, you, 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 you really button it up. Um, again, the rules are yours to decide, but you land on them. You should have, you know, a good logical reasoning for why these are the rules. But then once you deliver them, you should just move on pretty quickly. You don't want to get into a lot of why and back and forth with your kids about it. It ultimately becomes a losing game for you if you get sucked into the whys. Because then there's always another why. Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? Right? At some point it is because that those are the rules. Um, and that's the end of the conversation. And so you kind of need to you know, lovingly and gently but also firmly exit that dog chasing its tail conversation of well, why? Well, why? Well, why? It just doesn't – it's just not going to work well for you. Okay? Second thing is, it's not a pure democracy, right? You're the parent. You ultimately have decided what the rules are. But you can still listen and be open to feedback. But I think it's also important and appropriate to say to them, listen, I know you may not agree with this. I know you may not like this. This may not be your preference. But these are what the rules are going to be. This is just how it's going to work. I know you don't have to like it, but this is what's going on. I'm open to your feedback. And if I think it's reasonable, you know, if your dad and I or your mom and I think it's fair, we can, we'll, we'll consider reevaluating it. But just so you understand, it's not a pure democracy where everybody has an equal vote. You're the parents and you have the ultimate, you know, sort of deciding vote. The number thing, the other thing about this is that, and you won't see this immediately, but this actually will build trust. Even if they don't like it, and you're, you're, but if your logic is sound, they're, they're likely to think that you're fair. And for kids, for teens in particular, fair is a pretty, it's a very high premium currency, right? Like that's, a, that's a real premium thing. Like they, they always, fair is really important to them, right? So if, they, so if they don't like it, but if you're being fair, at some level that will probably register for them and they'll ultimately go along with it, you know? But you got to make sure it's, it's fairly logical, you know? For a lot of kids, like, you know, after dinner, not using technology may not really be logical and they may not be fair. Um, and I know this is also complicated because a lot of schools now use an online platform for delivering homework. So on the one hand, we're saying, yeah, we'll use less technology, but that 
the use of technology for, for entertainment or recreation and the use of technology for school tends to blend together pretty easily. Um, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of shades of gray in there. So I get that. So again, you're going to have to tease out the nuances and figure out what's going to work, but I'm trying to give you sort of some guidelines for how to best deal with it. Okay, the number two thing, or actually number three thing, right? So I said walk your talk, um, use the four C's, and then the third one is uh, make sure you and your spouse are on the same page so they cannot divide and conquer. Again, this is a theme that you've seen throughout the Your Successful Teen program. I don't need to go into it in enormous detail here, other than to say that it will be very easy for them to divide and conquer you on this issue if you and mom and dad are not on the same page. Okay, you got to really work with this together. You know, it can't be well. Mom says one thing, and then they go and say, "Well, mom said we have to turn." You know, dad said we could we could watch TV till ten o'clock. You know, after mom just told them it has to be turned off at you know eight thirty. Um, you don't want to you don't want to put you don't want to bring that into your relationship with one another, right? That's going to weaken your relationship. It's going to create unnecessary stress and tension and disagreement between the two of you. It's just not worth it. And it also isn't really good for your kids because then they just learn how to play you against one another. And, you know, at some point they have to understand, as, as we talked about in the program, that no is a complete sentence. And the answer is no, you can't watch TV right now. Um, no, you can't play video games right now. Let's read books. Let's do a jigsaw puzzle together. Maybe it's a bit of a corny example, but, but take it for what it is. Um, let's go throw the ball around. Let's go outside. Let's go for a walk. Um, let's have a conversation. But, but, you know, they have to understand at some point, no is a, is, is a complete sentence. And mom and dad need to be singing from the same sheet of music on that. And then finally, teaching them to self-regulate, right? And what I mean by that is that ultimately, their use of technology, you know, it's not something you want to have to spend a lot of time and energy policing, ideally. Right? You just don't have to spend a lot of time always checking with them. It, it, so you want to create, set it up ultimately over time so that, that they can self-regulate, so that when the established rule is that devices go off at 9 o'clock at night, let's say for sake of example, that you don't have to go walk in their bedroom and say, okay, it's 9 o'clock, it's time to turn the devices off. You know? Or when you happen to walk by their bedroom at 9.15, it's already off, and you don't have to really worry about it, right? Now, you know, with some kids, you are going to have to police it a little bit more. Um, but the point here is that part of the teaching them to self-regulate is realizing, but also being explicit with them, that managing technology is a conversation about trust, right? Or do you, you have to be very upfront with them about your level of trust and their ability to regulate it, to, to manage it responsibly. And it's, it's an important conversation to have, right? You know, can you, you, if you, if the rules are that it goes off at nine o'clock, can you trust that they will? Or you're going to have to remind them six times, and it's always going to be five more minutes, five more minutes. And if you weren't around, and if you didn't come remind them, that they would stay on there till 2 o'clock in the morning if they could get away with it. Partly what you're, the conversation to have with them is that in order for, in order for us to even be more liberal, consider being more liberal with the rules, we need, to, we need to trust that you understand how to use technology responsibly, right? And again, that can be an explicit conversation. And one of the things to think about and to figure out how to communicate to them about is what do you need to see in their behavior that builds your trust that they will actually use technology responsibly, right? So that may mean that they police themselves. That may mean that, you know, they're not sneaking around, um, you know, on some, you know, hidden device that maybe they borrowed from a friend, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, texting. It might mean that, you know, that they, when it's on the weekends, when, when you've kind of given them a directive that they can have X number of hours of screen time, that they truly, truly keep it to that. Um, again, so it's about trust. So I think a lot of that conversation is about helping them understand what you need to see in them to feel comfortable about their ability to self-regulate. And, and part of that maybe is sort of a carrot in the equation. The more you see them able to self-regulate, maybe the more you can be a little bit more liberal. On it. If you think that if they're not doing screen, if they're not letting screen time get in the way of schoolwork, or they're not letting screen time get in the way of other healthy activities, um, or helping out around the house, then maybe you can be a little bit more liberal about it. I think the ideal situation, you know, for any parent is that they don't feel like they have to police it, 
based on their kids' responsible use of technology, and they just don't even have to worry about it. Again, that may not be realistic in every family, but that probably would be where everybody would like to get to. And by using this, these sort of trust conversations with them about it, certainly can help move it in that direction. One other piece, is it okay to teach them, about teaching them to self-regulate? Is it okay to take it away? If they're not self-regulating, if they're constantly sneaking and pushing the limits, yes, you can take things away. It is your home. Remember, most of the technology stuff that they're doing is a privilege. It's not a right, right? Netflix is a privilege. Xbox is a privilege. These are not rights. Now, granted, being able to do their schoolwork is probably more closer to a right. Um, you know, and if, and if the trust level is so low, then maybe they have to do their, their homework and their technology use in a common room on a common computer, you know, or if there's a laptop that they have, then they have to use it in, in the common space. Um, in the common space. Sorry. Just had a little, uh, just a quick distraction here. Um, remember... So that where there's a will, there's a way, right? Like I have had parents that would take the Wi-Fi and shut it down um, and literally take it to bed at night, right? Like if, you're, if there's a constant battle, you can take devices away. You can take computers out of rooms. You can shut down the Wi-Fi. You can have cell phones probably, I think, turned off at a certain point. There's ways you can kind of regulate that. Um, you know, as the person who pays the cell phone bill, there's different tools you can use. Um, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, you know, if, if your children are not using it responsibly and are not self-regulating. Um, also remember that good habits are as addictive as bad habits, but they're much more rewarding, right? So a lot of teaching them to self-regulate is about helping them build good habits, right? So, you know, one thing is about being physically active, you know, and you don't have to play sports or be a, a superb athlete to be physically active and have a more healthy lifestyle. This is something you can do together. You can take a walk after dinner together instead of turning the TV on. Bring a soccer ball with you um, to a park and kick the ball around. Take up a martial art or maybe even do it together. Go for a bike ride. There's ways in which you can build healthy activities outside of screen time that don't necessarily have to involve you know, being a, a Michael Phelps stellar athlete. There's just ways you can just be out together playing and being engaged in things, um, building healthier habits that doesn't necessarily have to involve screen time, you know, and if it's not doing uh, sports activities, card games, board games, um, find healthy recipes and cook meals together, read a book together, do a jigsaw or a crossword puzzle. There was a friend of mine growing up, um, his family always had like one of those enormous, like 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzles in their house. And I always thought it was a really cool thing because they had like a sort of a whole table in their living room where there was always a puzzle on there. I think once they would finish it, they would laminate it and frame it or something or put it on the wall or I don't know what they would do with it. But, um, but there was always a puzzle there. And what was cool about it is it just became this sort of natural place to sort of congregate. You know, mom and dad would be in there kind of working on it. And they, then their, the kids, my, my friend and his brothers, would come in and just sort of sit down and just start working on it together. And it just became this sort of communal activity that people would sort of rally around. I just always thought it was this really cool, clever thing that their parents did. And I'm sure they actually enjoyed it, but it was just sort of this thing that was just sort of always there. And it was part of their family culture, if you will. And their kids really bought into it. So maybe you have to find that sort of unplugged thing that's just fun to do. It's all different kinds of, there's so many different games um, and activities that you could participate in like that. To recap this all together, Again, I just want to circle back to what I think is really the most important question to ask yourself, and that is, who is currently in charge of, your of how technology is used in your home? And then again, what do you want it to look like, right? As the parent, and this is often not an easy battle to fight, I get it, but especially if your kids and your teens are not using it responsibly, and if it is really they're involved in, in using technology to an unhealthy level, to an excessive degree, then you may need to really figure out how you're gonna strategically fight this battle with them. And then again, you have to really ask yourself, what do we want it to look like? 
And I know this is tough because so much of kids' social life is now on their phone and on social media and the various chats and just in dialogues and threads that are going on on Instagram or Snapchat or, or what have you. Um, and to just, you know, take it away can feel very hard for them. Um, it feels like they're really missing out on something. Um, and, and, and there may be some reality to that. So you're going to have to figure out, you know, who's in charge of it, who's calling the shots, and I'm suggesting you want it to be you. And you also have to think then about what do you really want it to look like. And then you're going to have to work with them. You may have to do a little bit of negotiating and finding the right sort of balance with things so that, you, so that they can self-regulate, that they can know when is right to use it and when is not right to use it, and they can put limits on it. So that at 2 o'clock in the morning or even 11 or 12 o'clock at night when they need to be sleeping and resting and getting ready for school or sports or whatever is going on the next day, that they're not up you know, compulsively spending time on their phones or in front of their devices. Um, and so you're going to have to figure out how, if it's a battle you really want to fight, then you need to figure out how to, how to really define it. But ultimately, no is a complete sentence. And you as the parent ultimately have the, the final say around how this stuff is going to be used in your home. And as much as they feel like they're missing out, also don't forget that those good habits are as easy to build um, as bad habits. Um, sometimes there may be some resistance to them, and they're ultimately more fulfilling. So you just may have to start to figure out where do you create the good habits um, at home and in your family. Um, and you may have to be careful about how you introduce that, because if they're really frustrated that they're losing some of their technology privileges, you may have to let them sort of pout about it a little while. You know, they may not... You can't just come in and say, hey, you can't use technology, but hey, let's go for a bike ride after dinner. They may just avoid doing it with you just out of protest. So you have to be sort of strategic about this and how you, how you integrate those things. Um, but again, where there's a will, there's a way. And ultimately what we're trying to get to is a, health, a healthier, more balanced lifestyle. Kids being up till 2 o'clock in the morning, as you heard me talk about in the introductory model, being up you know, way, very late, it just doesn't foster a healthy lifestyle. It doesn't foster, foster healthy lifestyle habits. The thing that we talked about is that, you know, it's usually tech, it's not technology that it, itself it's a problem. It's it's about excessive use of technology. It's about degree. Um, so you know, I think a lot of it is figuring out how you can negotiate with them so that they're getting enough of the involvement and connection and stimulation they're looking for from technology, but without it completely dominating and taking over their lifestyle um, and and eclipsing their ability to have a more healthy lifestyle and be more physically active and just involved in other positive forms of engagement. So that is it for this module. Uh, I thank you very much for tuning in, and I will uh, more, more information coming soon in different modules if you haven't listened to all of them yet, and I hope you're getting a great deal out of all the material. Thank you very much.